Welcome back to Sports Crunch with D. Crom, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, D. Crom. Although the birth certificate reads David Cromwell, you could call me D. Crom, but uh, that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's what you call me on the show, Sports Crunch with D. Crom. And anyways, we are today. We are starting a very special edition here at Sports Crunch with D. Crom. The NFL draft is approaching faster than you think. It is nine days. Begins nine weeks from this Thursday, and it. And the final phase of the NFL draft process begins in earnest this week in Indianapolis with the 2016 NFL Scouting Combine. And joining me for our first edition of our Dash to the Draft series here on Sports Club with D. Crom is a very special guest. He is an up-and-coming NFL draft whiz and analyst. He's, uh, he's got an amazing mind. He is the head of USA Today Sports' uh, draft webpage, thedraftwire.com. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome from the – the arguably the football capital of America, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Mr. John Ledyard to the show. What's going on, John? It's good to have you. Hey, thanks for having me, David. I'm excited to be on the show and looking forward to talking some NFL draft with you. I'm excited to have you on the show too, as, uh, as uh, it obviously pays me in, with, with football entering in so-called offseason and no football. But for the record, as a Denver Broncos fan myself this year, it's, it's easier to take because my team just won the freaking Super Bowl and, uh, <laughs> And the draft process couldn't have been more fun. I'll tell you that from my perspective this year, and I'm sure it feels the same you every time the Steelers win the Super Bowl. So, uh, uh, so, so. It, uh, but, but, but it's always one of my favorite times of year, no matter what. But it's extra sweet when your team wins the Super Bowl. But anywho, let's uh, move on to the first question. Uh, the cons- uh, amongst NFL scouts and analysts and uh, like like yourself. There are three quarterbacks who are probably going to go in the first round. They are obviously Jared Goff from California, uh, Cal Berkeley, Paxton Lynch from Memphis, and Carson Wentz from North Dakota State, uh, uh, one of the first uh, sub-Division I quarterbacks we will see in the first round that have gone in uh, quite some time. And uh, but, but there is some variation as to how different people view these quarterbacks. Like, for example, Mike Mayock, who um, uh, you were just on a conference call with earlier today, uh, uh, the acclaimed uh, draft analyst from NFL Network uh, has uh, Wentz actually as his first quarterback, but he obviously sings golf praises too. But I just want your opinion on this. Where, how do you have those three quarterbacks ranked at the moment, and, and why? Give us uh, a, a, a scouting analysis as to why you have them ranked where you do right now. Well, yeah, it's a good question, Dave, and it's a question a lot of people will talk about, uh, especially leading up to the draft and especially this week, I think, during combine workouts. And right now, the way I see it is, uh, honestly, for me, and Mayock was talking about this a little bit today, but he was talking about it with Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. I see it as a two-man race between Jared Goff and Paxton Lynch for me. So I like Paxton Lynch's upside the most, I think. I think he has the highest ceiling of any of the prospects, and I think that ceiling's very attainable with the right coaching, um, if you can get him in the, in, in the right system. I think he has the ability to make all the throws to all levels of the field, but he's got to learn to throw the ball with more finesse. Right now he's just gripping it and ripping it, and that was good enough at Memphis, but it won't be in the pros. So he needs to sit a year or two. Carson Wentz also needs to sit a year or two, but I don't see him maybe as having as smooth a transition process to the NFL as Paxton Lynch does, mainly because he has a little bit of a more difficult time going through his reads and progressions from the pocket, and it's a little bit slower. I still like Wentz a lot. He's a top 40 prospect for me. But all of these quarterbacks are kind of in the 30 to 40 range for me. I don't have a first-round grade on any of them. So Jared Goff's the most NFL-ready guy. He's probably got a really solid skill set, and I think he's going to be a solid starter in the NFL. Can he be that top 15, that upper echelon starter? That I don't know about. I think that the tape is mixed on him. There's some inconsistencies here and there. Um, but he does a lot of things well. He's great feet in the pocket, great presence. From what I've heard, he's a great leader, similar to Carson Wentz. That's an area of Paxton Lynch's game that's going to be uh, up and speculated this week, I think, at the Combine. So there's still a lot for us to learn about these guys, I think. But based on tape, Jared Goff's the most ready uh, to step into an NFL offense and take charge right away. But I think I like the upside of Paxton Lynch. And in a draft where I feel like the prospects are similar enough, right now I'm still leaning Lynch. But it does depend on the fit. For example, I think the Browns are probably best fit for Goff. Uh, And I think Hugh Jackson could work really well with him and his skill set in that offense. So I kind of see it as a mix. Everyone wants to know who's one, two, and three for you and just have a clear and concise like that. But it rarely is at the quarterback position. It's about fit. It's about fitting a guy and his talents 
into your offense. The Broncos just won the Super Bowl with Peyton freaking Manning with <laughs> basically no arm and no skill left. And they won it because they got creative, went off with their play calling, and obviously their defense was huge as well. But they got creative enough and good enough with their play calling and relying on the run and what could be their strengths at that time. So that kind of coaching, I think, can be molded around a number of different guys at quarterback. So that's why the rankings maybe aren't as clear and concise as some people would like. Uh, absolutely. And I, I had this thought earlier today that obviously with Peyton Manning likely to obviously retire right now and Tom Brady, yes, uh, he says he wants to play forever, but I think he could play three, four or five more years at best, but I think that's about it for him. So his time uh, is coming soon as well, I think. But after those two retire, you'll have Aaron Rodgers towards the twilight of his career and Andrew Luck, and, uh, and a bunch of wild card variables. So the NFL is kind of, they say it is a quarterback driven league, and I think it is to some degree, but with the Seahawks two years ago and the Broncos this year, I think we are seeing a sign that it is kind of moving a little slightly towards more of a defensive oriented league. Um, uh, um, uh, w- w- would you like to chime in on that? Yeah, I think that there's definitely uh, truth to be said for that. And I think that points across the board are still substantial in the NFL, obviously, and high-scoring passing offenses are still at a premium, and those teams still can be successful. Well, it'll be interesting to see because this year it was strange. Um, there was an aberration in some ways because Denver really didn't, despite the fact that you know they won most of their games, obviously, throughout the year. They didn't technically look like a quote-unquote Super Bowl-winning team throughout most of the season, but were able to get the job done in the playoffs, obviously beat – two really good teams in, in New England and Carolina and not to take away from their other wins as well. So, but there were points in the season where you didn't think, that. so it, it was a strange year. It was a strange postseason. I think I definitely think that if, if it showed one thing, the fact that Denver won the Super Bowl was that pass rushers are at a premium and you need to find them when you can. And I think that that will raise and elevate the stock of guys like Noah Spence and Joey Bosa and Shaq Lawson and Kevin Dodd and even Shalit Calhoun, who has fallen down in a lot of draft analysts minds. But I think he's a guy who could sneak in the back end of the first round because pass rush is valued so much. And um, I think you'll see guys throughout the week as they work out well, if they have upside as a pass rusher, you know, we're already seeing a little bit with uh, Kamale Correa from Boise State, his stock starting to elevate just because he's got upside. He's got an explosive first step. He's got tools you can work with. Um, he's raw for sure. He's got to use his hands better. But Denver's success and the ability to build and honestly win the Super Bowl based heavily upon what their edge rushers could do is going to bode really well for edge rushers and these pass rush guys coming into the draft. I, I completely agree. And, um, uh, and that brings us to our next uh, topic of, uh, of discussion here. Uh, but you mentioned Kamali Correa, a guy who um, uh, I've read uh, as well is uh, getting um, uh, an uptick in interest from uh, scouts and personnel departments around the NFL at the moment. Um, uh, 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 let's uh, add to that list of names like which players can see their draft stock rise exponentially or fall sharply based on their performance and and interviews this week in Indianapolis well performance and interviews uh two definitely two different arenas I think for players right now so um let me say interviews first I think Noah Spence and Robert and Kandichi from um from uh Mississippi I think they're gonna have that process of being able to meet with teams and being able, teams are going to be able to feel out where are the character concerns with these guys? Are they still valid? Are they not? Um, You know, even a guy like Jalen Mills from LSU, others who I'm sure are are slipping my mind too, that Connor Cook is another one, maybe not off the field concerns, but definitely, you know, character, see the kind of leader we want. So that's going to be huge for those guys and and other ones I'm sure that aren't coming to my mind right now. Um, But in terms of on-field workouts, I think you're going to see, important results for Vernon Hargraves, who, who probably needs to run pretty well to, to hang on to that top 15, top 20 status he's kind of clinging to right now. Some guys still have him in the top 10. I love his skill set. Um, but does he have that long recovery speed that Jalen Ramsey does? Um, I think um, there's going to be a, a process of feeling out that number one cornerback spot. So I think when the defensive backs uh, run and when they work out, I think that's going to be heavily scrutinized by the media, as it always is for that position. But I think that a number of players have the chance to really elevate their stock if they run well. William Jackson can really elevate his stock if he performs well there. The cornerback from Houston, um, Jalen Mills from LSU, can really elevate his stock um, if he performs well there. So there's a number of guys in the defensive backfield, and then I think flipping the opposite side of the ball at the wide receiver position, 
Josh Doxson now, you know, Laquan Treadwell's not running, he said, at, at the, at the uh, combine. So Josh Doxson now has an opportunity to go and I think run really well. He's similar enough to Treadwell in a lot of ways that a lot of teams will be like, you know, Dotson's here. He wants to run. We're going to look at uh, what he offers us and uh, maybe not consider him higher than Treadwell, but if they lose out on Treadwell, more readily jump on uh, the, the Dotson train and try and maybe pick him up as a receiver a little higher than he would have. Michael Thomas from Ohio State, another one who's going to be in that boat. I think um, guys you know are going to are going to work out well. Just kind of have to uh, affirm that. Will Fuller has to affirm that. Um, I think Sterling Shepard has to affirm that. Braxton Miller has to affirm that. So that's going to be important for all those guys. But certainly there's – we could talk about prospects at every position. The, the, the combine always shifts focus a little bit. Guys that nobody was really talking about, like Byron Jones last year with Dallas, you know, he blows up the combine, sets a world record in the broad jump, and everybody's talking about him, you know, and we go and visit his tape and we see, you know, here's a pretty good freaking player. So a lot of times it can lead us back to the tape, and that's a good thing. And sometimes guys blow up the combine and they don't have it as a player and they're just a workout warrior. So it all needs to be weighed within context of the tape. But as always, there's a number of players who can really prove themselves and, and really, um, for many, solidify their status in the first round. I completely agree. It all comes down to the tape for, for me as well. And that is something that too many um, uh, 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 scouts or, and personnel people in the NFL get a little too lazy with these things at times. Like uh, they like put so much stock into the combine that they tend to ignore uh, the tape. Uh, uh, and, that's, uh, and, and that's very troublesome. And, uh, um, and before we get on to the next question, uh, this other question popped into my head. Um, how much stock – should we as lay should lay people casual observers like myself put into this combine uh, like uh, like how like what workout should we take more seriously than the others and uh, and uh, like and what percent of the of the overall evaluation which includes like tape and character and uh, and stuff like that should should it like is it like ten percent twenty percent yeah it's hard for me to ask this question but mm-hmm. basically uh, like I hear you you can't overrate but you can't underrate the combine how um, uh, would you uh, would you uh, evaluate the combine and uh, how much stock would you put into it God I I've been a loss for words it's such a complicated question forgive me difficult <laughs> question to answer too because uh, it honestly matters differently for each player I think and if it, the con- the combine is extremely important in terms of their on-field workouts because it allows you to be able to collect more data on a player. And that can't really ever be a bad thing if you're viewing it in context with their tape. Um, so it's all about keeping a proper perspective. I think the combine is part of that perspective. It helps quantify what you see on tape. It's really helpful for smaller school guys, you know, no offense is blowing around, you know, offensive tackles at Eastern Kentucky with no problem. Is he going to be able to do it against the NFL? It's really hard to quantify on tape when you don't see him against that caliber of a player. So the combine gives you an idea, okay, here's his scores against players who've had similar scores in the, that are in the NFL now. How does that match up? So I think it allows you really good perspective in that way. Now, there's always going to be exceptions to the rules, and if you just evaluate by the combine, you're probably going to be disappointed with the results of your evaluations. So the tape is always the most important thing for me. The combine, especially looking at numbers and, and, and workouts and things like that, helps me quantify what I see on tape, I think. So if I see a player run, and Mayhawk said this today, fast guys run fast, slow guys run slow and work out slow and, and, and work out fast uh, um, and so on. But when you see the opposite happen, when you see something unexpected happen, then you revisit the tape and you look at it. Maybe you compare them to a prospect who his numbers matched up against on tape. Maybe you look at a guy like, Anquan Bolden, you know, uh, Jarvis Slander, guys who had slower 40 times, and you had to maybe go back and look at their tape. And in both of those guys' cases, you saw guys who could still play, who didn't have to be the fastest burners down the field and could still win the way they played the game. Um, Jarvis Landry's stock dropped. I still was in love with him as a player, and he's been able to continue to be successful because Miami uses him appropriately and uses his strengths appropriately. So it's part of the process of quantifying these players. But it isn't the whole picture, and we need to be careful and make sure we see it that way. But we also need to be careful and make sure we don't dismiss it entirely. Different positions are going to have different values for different workouts throughout the combine. Um, Justice Mosquito, I think, does a great job talking about force players, which is a, a formula he basically invented to scout and evaluate edge defenders and pass rushers. talks about how vertical jumps and jumps in general 
and three cone times are so important to judging pass rushers, but not 40 times. So we look at 40 times, but really he said for, based on the mathematical equations that he's come up with, which have been highly accurate uh, and successful for him in scouting uh, pass rushers, those 40 times don't matter as much. Now for receivers, they definitely matter. For cornerbacks, there's been mixed results. So it's really about studying the process, something I think I'm going to do a lot this summer uh, during the off-draft off season is study um, the tendencies that each team has to draft a guy. You know, do the Cardinals draft all guys with 4-4, you know, 40s to play in their secondary, or do they ever go lower, you know, and things like that. So looking at those numbers across the board, every team will evaluate differently. It's You can't say it enough. Uh, a, a bad 40 could drop a player off the Raiders board and keep him right where he was on the Patriots board. So – that's going to be part of the process. It's just going to be the way the different teams see different players. Uh, they'll, but they'll value the combine differently. You saw Bill Belichick said this week, they don't really value the combine that much in New England. They don't. And the stats back up and, and show that. I think they've taken less – because somebody did a study today, I think they've taken less combine players um, than any other team. Last year they drafted Shaq Mason in the fourth round. He wasn't invited to the combine. He was an offensive guard, and he started for them all year. So – that kind of stuff per team is just going to vary. And, and, and you got to accept that as an analyst. And for me to do my job, I've just got to view things in a vacuum. I'm not a team. I'm an analyst. I've got to take all the data in front of me and evaluate my board appropriately. Absolutely. You never know, especially uh, like I always stress this to my, my listeners, scouting, whether it be in football or any other sport or any other profession, it, it, that is not rocket science. Each team, like as you said, has their own unique way of evaluating talent, and it, it, and they evaluate talent in terms of their own prism, their own system, based on what they do. And and, and you have to do that because if you pick a, a piece that doesn't fit your system, uh, you're going to be lost for years. So, uh, so you nailed it right on the head. And now I want to get into some uh, more of a hypothetical scenarios that could unfold on draft day. Even though it's early now, it's never too early to start speculating what could happen and one of the main points that many uh, draft observers are speculating about is what do the Tennessee Titans do with the first oral pick since they already have their their quarterback of the future in uh, Marcus Mariota uh, the name that I think um, uh, comes to everybody's mind is Laramie Tunsil the offensive tackle uh, the left tackle uh, from Mississippi but uh, a lot of people are saying that a quarterback hungry team wanting to jump Cleveland for a Goff or a Wentz or a Paxton Lynch might be might trade with the Titans, and the Titans might be, have been said they'll be open to explore the alternative of trading back. Uh, however, if they do want Tunsil, I don't think they, they could afford to trade back that far because the Chargers would kill to have a guy like Tunsil protecting the blind side of Phillip Rivers uh, uh, for the final years of Philip Rivers' career. The Chargers are sitting pat at three. And uh, the Titans uh, could ill afford to fall behind the Chargers if they really want Tunsil. So, um, so uh, the question is, uh, it, it, it's basically a three-part question rolled into one. Should the Titans trade down uh, from the first overall draft spot, slot? And do you see it? Uh, what potential partners do you see for them? And how far down do you think they'll they should trade? Yeah, it's a good question. So here's the scenario: is the way I see it, and I'll try and lay it out as simply as I can. First, we're in February, and the combine hasn't happened, and free agency hasn't happened. And so it is really, really difficult to anticipate how this is all going to turn out. So much is going to change, even for the teams. They don't even know. The Tennessee Titans may have Tunsil first on their board. You never know what's going to happen in free agency. You don't know what's going to happen in your offseason. Different things can arise, and you know you don't know what, what you're going to get offered. You could get a crazy offer for the number one overall spot with a team that just falls in love with Goff and thinks that Cleveland is going to take him. If Goff works out well, if Wentz works out well and a team really wants him and they think Cleveland's in love with him, you would be surprised at the things that the, at, at what Tennessee might get offered. Now, let's say Tennessee knows that the Chargers love Jalen Ramsey or love DeForest Buckner. Already those two things are being rumored. Maybe they also end up loving Ronnie Stanley. There are scenarios where the Titans could trade down to four if the Cowboys thought that Tennessee, that, uh, that Cleveland loved Carson Wentz or Jared Goff, but I think Carson Wentz seems to be the popular name right now, the guy that the Cowboys like and potentially the Browns like, and Jerry Jones wanted him bad enough, there's the potential for the Cowboys to try and jump up to number one, the Titans to move down to number four, and then in that scenario, Wentz would maybe go one, Cleveland could settle for Goff at number two, or a Joey Bosa or a Ramsey, someone like that. 
And then the Chargers could choose from Tunsil, Buckner, and Ramsey at number three, potentially even Bosa at number three, or Noah Spence. The Chargers could have the best players in the draft available to them because the top two teams, if Dallas were to trade up, could reach for quarterbacks. Now, this is all just hypothetical scenario at this point. But let's say that the Chargers select either Ramsey or, um, or Bosa or Buckner at that point in the draft, all of whom they reportedly like. The, you could legitimately, if you're the Titans, move down to four, stockpile picks, get the best player in the draft who you were going to get at number one. So the Titans are going to have options open to them if the quarterbacks work out well. So if you're Tennessee, you're praying the quarterbacks work out great. You're praying the interview process goes well. You're praying that Cleveland falls in love and people know about it and everyone wants to jump them for the top quarterback in the draft. And if that's the case, then you're going to have suitors. Now, it's incredibly difficult to trade out of the number one spot. Tennessee is going to maybe have to take what's available to them if they if they want to trade out of that number one pick. But I think at the end of the day, they're going to have that option. They're going to have offers for sure. It's just going to depend on how much a team loves one of those quarterbacks at the top. It's going to be really fun to see a play out because Tennessee has their franchise quarterback, and that gives you flexibility at the top. They can move down to four, and they could be totally happy with Ramsey. They could be totally happy with Bosa. They could be totally happy with Spence. They could fit Buckner into their – you know, they can do so many things at four and still get a great player in the draft and feel fine about it because you have your left tackle and Taylor the one if you can't get another one, and you have your quarterback. So you have two really big needs there. You have Doriel Green Beckham. You need a running back. You can stockpile picks and pick up one later in the draft if you want. You can trade down and get Ezekiel Ali in the first round. So there's tons of options available to Tennessee. They'd be very wise, and I think they will keep their phone lines open. And it would be awesome to see someone trade out of the first pick. We don't normally get that drama at the top of the draft, and I think it'd be really fun for the draft to have it happen again, and I think it's quite possible this year. I think it is too, but as you said, it's it's we've entered the only the beginning of the end process, as I alluded to at the beginning of the program of, of the draft. So, uh, but we have nine more. They have nine more weeks to think about it. And in football, uh, one an overnight is an eternity, as they say. So, uh, so that. Well, speaking of Larry Tunsil, uh, I wanted to ask you this question because it was a question that was perplexing me as well as many top-notch uh, analysts all season long this past season. Why on earth has the state of the offensive line play in the NFL, especially from the uh, offensive tackle position? Why has it declined so goddamn much to get to this point? And do you see any potential offensive tackles, aside from Larry Tunstall, who I think is going to be a successful pro, uh, that can break the streak of first-round offensive tackle busts in recent years, like the Eric Fishers, the Luke Jokels, even Greg Robinson hasn't looked good to this point. Um, uh, like, well, what tackles do you see, if any, breaking that streak? Uh, Tunsil's definitely one. I I don't think I've ever said in my years of scouting that a player necessarily is generational, other than Andrew Luck. And I think that Tunsil has that ability to be to be that kind of guy um, at left tackle. Excellent player. Uh, without any real weaknesses, uh, just can continue to get better from uh, the position. He's, he's my number one overall player. Now, you hope that the off, off any off the field stuff is interesting. There'll be some connection with Kim Dietschy and his off the field issues, both of them obviously in Mississippi. Until I hear that, I can't do anything about that. He's number one player on my board. When something's substantiated, everyone will be the first to know. We'll all hear about it, I'm sure. The draft process always reveals these things. But in terms of on-the-field potential, I think he's the best player in the class. Um, I think Taylor Decker is going to be a heck of a player for a long time in this league. Maybe he plays right tackle. I think he plays left tackle. It's probably going to depend on the team. I think he can play at either position. He's going to be one of the best run-blocking offensive linemen in the draft. Um, he's extremely tough, long, physical, nasty dude in the trenches. Um, his feet aren't quite as good as Tunsil or Stanley. as quite as quick, but they're very clean very technically sound, and I love that about him as a prospect. I think he improved tremendously this past year. I had him as a mid-round guy heading into the year. Now I think he's a top 15 lock, and he should go in that range. He has that kind of ability. Um, Ronnie Stanley is a little is, is a little bit scary. Uh, there's, there's talk about him off the field not being as committed as he needs to be or, or in terms of his work ethic. I don't think it really shows on the field. Some people say they want to see more nastiness from him. The more I watch him, I don't really have that concern, to be honest. I think Technically, he needs a little bit of work. Mike Mayock loves him, and he talked about that today. He thinks he's 
closer to Tunsil than some people think. I know some people that have him in the second round. Um, so opinions just vary on him a lot, and I think he's going to be a little bit of a boomer bust guy. Um, but I think that he has really high end potential, and if he stays committed to the game and gets the right coaching, he can be a great left tackle in the NFL for years to come. Uh, y- yes, I've I've heard similar sentiments on Stanley a- a- as you just echoed. But another uh, tackle that uh, Lewis Riddick of ESPN, an analyst whose insight I value very highly loves is Jack Conklin out of Michigan State. Do you have any thoughts on Jack Conklin? Yeah, Jack Conklin, I, I saw Luis's thoughts. He, he is a very intelligent football mind. Um, I don't necessarily agree with him on Conklin if, if he thinks – I didn't see whether he said this or not, but if he thinks Conklin can be a left tackle in the NFL, there's a potential for me uh, to see Conklin. I want to see him at guard. I want to see him inside. He has technical flaws to work on, but I think he can be a dominant uh, run blocker inside. Pass protection is going to take some time for him, I think. But if you put him on the left side, his feet just are not good enough. It's just that simple. Uh, his feet are going to get him in a lot of trouble uh, as, a, as a blindside protector. There's a potential to play on the right side, but I don't see a whole, whole lot of difference in today's NFL, to be honest. I mean, you've got great pass rushers coming off the left and right sides, and I'm not sure uh, one gives you an advantage over the other. If he's more comfortable on the right side and we don't know about it, teams will have to evaluate that in the interview process. But um, as it stands right now, I like him best inside a guard, but I think he can be second or third round talent that ends up being a pretty quality starting guard in the NFL if he uh, gets the right training and coaching. Uh, yes. Uh, continuing with offensive line um, uh, f- uh, f- for, for a minute. Uh, Mayock also said this on the conference call, and you tweeted it out, and I retweeted, or I quoted you in my own tweet, uh, uh, what he mentioned about t- tackles moving inside the guards. And I, I believe it was talking about Jermaine I- Ifedi from Texas A&M. Uh, if, uh, forgive me if I pronounce that name wrong, Jermaine Ifedi, about he say if, if he wants to be successful, he's going to have to switch from tackle to guard. And I tweet back, you could say that about a lot of prospective NFL offensive linemen these days because, like, uh, like using the Broncos as an example, um, like, uh, uh, well, obviously the Panthers' offensive tackles stunk in, in, in Super Bowl 50, but the Broncos' offensive tackles were no better in my opinion. And uh, like, and the last two offensive tackles the Broncos drafted, Michael Schofield in 2014 and Ty Sambrilo last year, to me, they're more like guards because mm-hmm. because they're what people call shovers because they, they don't move their feet. They lunge. They just shove mm-hmm. people out. And, 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 they, and they don't have the feet to like, to like mirror and hang with these elite pass rushing monsters like the Khalil Max, Justin Houston, J.J. Watts, Von Millers, you name it. Um, uh, 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 yeah, so do you think that part of the big problem with offensive line play is that these uncertainty of incoming linemen in the NFL, like they're confused guys, like what are they? Are they tackles, guards? Do they play right, left? Who, who, who do we know? Do you think that's one of the heartbeats of the problem here? Well, it's it's more of a problem to me that I just don't think there are many players who are right now who are being developed well enough to play tackle at a high level in the NFL. So you have, first of all, the guys who are athletically too limited to play in that kind of space against the level of pass rusher we have today. So there's three parts to it in my mind, really. You, you have the level of pass rusher that, that they have to, are asked to face in the NFL, which is at a premium right now. It's, it's better probably uh, from an athleticism standpoint and, and even a skill standpoint than most we've seen in the NFL, really, I think, uh, up to this point. Now, um, you also have the fact that there just are not that many elite athletes playing tackle anymore, whether they're getting switched to other positions because there's more quote-unquote glory at other positions, or they're just not being developed in NFL-style systems. For example, the Raven Clark, he is an athlete who can play tackle in the NFL, but he's in a spread system in college. So the technical refinement and footwork that he's going to have to undergo to fit in the NFL is obviously going to be substantial and needs to be weighed that way by NFL teams. So a guy who has the tools but isn't ready technically because he doesn't play in a pro style system. So the college systems are a huge part, I think, of what's hurting these guys, these offensive linemen as they transition to the NFL. I wonder if it will start to weigh in evaluations for these guys as they consider where to go to college. If you're an offensive lineman, if you consider a pro style uh, team, school that might be scouting you over other ones, just because it prepares you better for the next step. If you think that you'll have an NFL career, but right now that's, Certainly an issue looking across the league. Um, And the other thing I think is that the coaching is just not that good. I mean, Indiana is is a prime example of this with Jason Spriggs. I think the guy started for a left tackle for four years there, but you see so many technical issues with him and his pass sets and and with his knee bend and and his hand placement and 
even getting his weight out over his feet that didn't really change throughout four years. I mean, yes, there were improvements in some areas of his game, but by and large, the issues remained. And you could see at the Senior Bowl, Cowboys coaches working with him and teaching him play with better knee bend. You'll get more leverage in your punch. Place that punch inside both hands, sharp pop to the chest, and all the different things that you'll talk about with offensive linemen. And you could see them walking through that process with him and him starting to adapt and mold it into his game. But my question is, how does that not happen in four years as a starter? How, how do you not get um, that kind of coaching? So by, long story short, I think that the coaching is a big part of it as well. So uh, the caliber of player they face, certainly the athletic limitations that a lot of these guys bring to the table that force them to move inside to guard where they don't have to play in as much space or have as, as elite uh, a footwork, but also the fact that the coaching just isn't that great. Um, and part of that comes from the system they play in the NFL, um, but also part of it just comes from the fact that I think a lot of these uh, coaches see that a player is, is able to survive in college football without developing certain skills just based on their pure fit. I mean, J- Jason Spriggs is another – it's a perfect example because he has length, he has physicality, he has toughness, he has athleticism. So he could he could thrive in, in college football without being technically refined, and coaches let him do that. But now in the NFL, it's going to be a completely different story. We see that with Eric Fisher. We saw that with Jake Matthews in year one. We see that with a lot of offensive tackles today, guys who are – get very gifted and have the tools to be able to succeed, but weren't trained appropriately and technically uh, refined to the point where they could transition to the NFL smoothly. So patience with offensive line pays off. I think you're seeing Eric Fisher finally improve. You saw Jake Matthews improve this year. Greg Robinson is improving. It's, it's, it's been slow, but he is improving and maybe doesn't have as good a coaching as the other guys. So there's processes that each of these linemen go through, but I think long story short, that's, that's the gist of it. Thank, uh, thank you. I really appreciate that uh, that analysis, and I've I've heard many of um, uh, similar complaints um, uh, that were said by NFL offensive line coaches themselves, in particular um, uh, Tom Cable, the uh, Seahawks uh, offensive line coach, uh, who said that the uh, spread systems have taken away from the technical development of these players, and that's why the Seahawks have done what they did with their offensive line by taking people who are defensive linemen and training them to be offensive line because they think they can develop them more uh, more quickly than uh, than a uh, Traditional college hasn't offense. hasn't worked out, hasn't worked out great for the Seahawks, but <laughs> uh, well, uh, it, it definitely has. But they should have traded away Max Hunger. I'll tell you that they made a big That's mistake true. trading away Max Hunger for Jimmy Graham. Uh, yeah, Agreed. and uh, and uh, we're almost done. But I have two more. Uh, forgive me. Uh, I, I understand hypotheticals are we. It's inconclusive right now. We don't know it. That's for sure. But but uh, but the masses just love to speculate even with nine weeks out. And I have two more hypothetical situations for you. And one important name that we criminally forgot to address on this program is Notre Dame linebacker Jalen Smith. The word for that ACL tear, and uh, he tore some other ligaments as well in case, uh, in case I missed any, did he? Yeah, I think there was uh, – I can't – I've looked at so many injuries, I can't remember the exact details right now, but there was significant lig- ligament damage in his knee for sure. Uh, yes, if it was if it wasn't for that knee injury, he would have been a candidate for the first overall pick. Uh, he received endless comparisons to former 49ers linebacker legend Patrick Willis, who who I think should go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame eventually. Patrick Willis, and uh, whatever you get compared to a guy of that caliber, um, uh, people salivate. And uh, and this tape uh, showed good reason. Jalen Smith's sideline to sideline speed just amazing. But obviously, he blew up his knee. And he probably will not be able to play at least, at most, or at least, dare I say, half of the 2016 season. But let's say you pick, you're picking like it, the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 range. And, uh, and like all those top guys, Tunsil, uh, DeForest Buckner, Joey Bosa, uh, Hargraves, if he stays up there, Jalen Ramsey, all those guys are gone. And you uh, don't like the options on your board at your positions of need. Would you consider pouncing on Jalen Smith as your as an important future piece for your team in that in that range of the draft, especially if his medicals uh, check out well enough? Yeah, I mean, if his medicals check out well enough, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a ton of teams that need linebackers in there. You know, even you look at the Dolphins at eight. Giants need him, the Saints need him, the Bears need him. So a lot of teams are going to be looking, the Raiders need him. So that range is going to be all those teams could take Jalen Smith and we wouldn't be surprised. Um, it's just going to come down to his medicals, honestly. Like 
if he's there, at my if Miami picks and his medicals are great. If he even gets that far, if his medicals are great, you know, Matt Miller reporting not that long ago for Bleacher Report that he could be ready for Week One of the of the 2016 season. Uh, recently, reports have come out that teams don't expect him to play at all during the 2016 season. So we have no, I don't know how to judge that. I mean, I've heard reports from both sides that I trust and believe. I just think right now, no one really knows. Um, and it's, it's too early in the process to be able to say, hopefully combine medicals will shed some, shed some light on it. I think we still have a long way to go with it. I think the Jalen Smith saga is probably going to go right up until the draft. Uh, we're just going to hear, you know, as his knee starts to progress, we're going to hear different reports. You know, if Notre Dame's pro day, maybe we'll hear something, you know, we don't know what that process is going to look like. So like you said, it's really hard to speculate, but if his medicals check out, he's ready to go for the 2016 season or they're expecting to make a full recovery. Teams are going to have to weigh all that appropriately. I don't know how they'll do that, um, but I just don't – there's just – there's so many linebacker and ED teams in the teens, even as we get down to where the, the Lions are and where the Falcons are, um, that I just don't know. The Jets are probably going to need one. I, I just don't know that he makes it out of that range um, as long as there isn't any long-term health concerns. Uh, so his ability is that good. Obviously, he's talented enough to be considered as a top-10 pick, in my opinion, uh, before he got hit or before he got hurt. Um, So I think now at this point, it's just going to be evaluating how healthy can he be and how quickly can he return to full health and um, can he be the same player he was. And it's going to be a level of risk in that no matter what the assessment is. But I think uh, for some teams, it'll be a risk worth taking. I I, I absolutely agree. Uh, So much talent there. And I still think uh, this, this, this doesn't look like an injury as bad as it is that he can't eventually return to full form from. So um, uh, he'll definitely be worth it there if they're satisfied with the medicals. And uh, you, we talked about guys like Noah Spence and Robert and And Mike Mayock uh, told Peter King of Sports Illustrated, uh, as Peter King uh, wrote in his uh, Monday, Monday morning column this week, that he thinks that Kevdichi and Spence, because of their character issues, are the two biggest wild cards of the draft. They could end up going like at the high end of the first round, as you suggested, or they could fall down to the middle or lower end of the first round or worse, uh, uh, depending on how things uh, shake out. But the hypothetical situation is this. There's been a lot of chatter amongst Broncos fans on Twitter because we obviously most of us are well at least a significant a chunk of us are accepting the fact that the Broncos will probably let another team slightly overpay for Malik Jackson in free agency so they're going to have to fight and with the amount of uh, defensive line talent available in, in, in this draft uh, which is an insane amount of uh, that the Broncos could find a similar player to develop uh, in, in this draft but Let's say it, it can be Chief's draft stock falls around the early 20s, and your Denver's sitting at 31. Last year they made a similar move to go get Shane Ray, going from like a 28 to 23. And if uh, that Kevdichi winds up falling into that range, as some people are anticipating he might, if you're John Elway, would you consider trading up to get Robert and Kevdichi if that's the case? I honestly wouldn't know. I just don't think he's that type of prospect. I mean, yes, he's talented, but there's, first of all, so many off-the-field issues that have been documented over the years, assault, pot. There's other whispers that it was more serious stuff. You know, I just think that he's a guy, you know, he's, he's so close with his brother, and his brother's been a bad influence. And there's there's just so many negatives surrounding him right now in terms of off-the-field that I would never trade up for a guy like that, um, first of all. Second, even when you consider him on the field – He's just too inconsistent. I mean, there's there's flashes of great talent. We've seen lots of players come through the league like that um, over the years. There'll be another one. Even if he ends up being a star somewhere else, I don't think you regret not trading up and not giving up something for him. I just don't think he's that type of player. He's not distanced himself from his issues um, at this point. Like, if anything, they're they're far too close to to warrant a risk like that. So yeah, he's going to do great at the combine. He's going to blow up the combine. He's going to get you know all these things. He is an athletic freak, but he's too inconsistent. There's just um, kind of like a core set of, uh, of basic technical principles uh, of playing defensive line that he consistently abandons on tape. Um, he doesn't use his hands super well all the time. There's plays where he's just dead weight, and he doesn't really know, seem to know what he's doing, or, or, or he can't track the ball with his eyes. And there's just issues like that that come from playing basic football that he's really never been able to do consistently at a high level. Now he'll flash and make plays that most of the players in this draft aren't capable of making. But to me – the element of risk both on and off the field that you have to undergo 
to get to that point with him where he can reach his ceiling is just too great. I mean, uh, honestly, I don't have him graded as a first round prospect. And I probably, uh, I think that he's more of a third round guy based on the issues. Yeah. The upside's high, but we see it a lot with players. And to me, the chances of him getting there based on everything that we know about him are are pretty slim, I think. And so I would take him in the third round and you take that risk with him maybe. But uh, honestly, before then, I think, and I think he'll be off some teams draft boards completely, but before then, I don't think I would take a swing in. And now some team will, but I definitely wouldn't trade up for him, and I don't think Elway will either. Uh, I don't either because some people don't know oh, Shade Ray is trouble. What Shade Ray did was peanuts compared to what Kambichi has done. Wouldn't you say so? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally, yes. And, uh, and uh, that will be another interest, one of many interesting developments we are going to be following in these next uh, couple months. And that does it for today here on Sports Crunch with D. Crom in our first edition of our Dash to the Draft series. And we'd like to thank once again Mr. John Ledyard from the Sports Wire of USA Today Sports, Sports, Sports Wire – Draftwire.com, man, yeah. <laughs> Draftwire.com, USA, uh, from, uh, USA, from USA Today Sports, for joining us, for giving us his insightful analysis of the draft and what to look for at the combine this week and these next nine weeks going forward. And we thank you so much, John, and we hope this isn't going to be the only time you contribute to our program. Hey, thanks a lot, David. I appreciate it, man. We'll do it again sometime soon. Absolutely. And that does it for today on Sports Crunch with D. Crom. I am off next week, but we hope to be back in two weeks again with another edition of Dash of the Draft here on Sports Crunch with D. Crom. Take care, everybody. <laughs>